Hello, and welcome to session two of the Christian Foundations of Our Deepest Values. In this class, we will talk about human rights, dignity, and equality. Where does the idea of human dignity come from? What about rights? What sort of cultures do we find these concepts in? And what about equality? Is that an idea that's unique to particular cultures? Or is it natural? Do we find it in every culture? Rights, equality, dignity, where do these ideas emerge that we take so much for granted? Where do human rights come from, turtles? Can you tell me? Hello, Mr. Duck. Do you have any rights? Do you think I have any rights? If I do have rights, where do those rights come from? What is the basis for their existence? What is the foundation stone upon which they rest? Where do rights come from? Where do you think rights come from? Rights? Um, well, I mean, I think they basically come from our government. Like, they get to decide what we do, but I feel like people like ourselves, we can change them. Like, if enough people come together and, you know, I think we can make change with our rights, but, I mean, overall, I think rights come from what we think we should be able to do. And, like, we've been able to change certain rights that we've been able to have. So I think they all stem from what we think we should be able to do, but in the end, it's basically wherever we live, our government deciding Okay. What we to do. Okay, thank you. Do rights come from justice? Or does justice come from rights? Are rights natural? Or are they socially or politically conferred? What we find when we look at different cultural traditions throughout history is that many of the rights that we take for granted as basic are actually highly contentious and controversial over time and throughout different places. Do those who are hungry have a right to food? Does a berry have a right to not be eaten? Do I have a right to not be eaten? What about a chicken? Does a chicken have a right to not be eaten? What about a cow? What about a monkey? What about a dolphin? Do I have a right to peace and quiet when I'm hiking in the wilderness? Does this bird have the right to eat its prey? Which I believe it just did. We just missed, missed an actual kill. We were just moments from an actual kill of a falcon eating prey. Almost got it on film. In the case of the hawk hunting and eating the sparrow, it would seem that might, might makes right. That because the hawk or falcon has the ability or the strength to kill and eat its prey, that that is all the right in the world that it needs. If might makes right, then what place is there for love in the world? If rights come from government, perhaps we can understand them better by looking at how different governments in different cultures have granted rights throughout history. We can understand how rights have been established and how rights have changed to see whether there are any rights that are constant. We can begin our discussion of rights by looking at 
documents such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is one of the founding documents of the United Nations. And this was a document that was um, a declaration issued by uh, multiple nations, multiple cultures, after World War II. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights begins by declaring that the inherent dignity of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. It then reaffirms the faith that the charter members of the United Nations have in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, and in the equal rights of men and women. And so here we have the beginning. We can look at this and think about how they start this document, this foundational dark document. They start it by declaring in a leap of faith, essentially, that humans have inherent dignity, that humans are of one family, and this is the foundation for all the rights which they then list. The rights that they list include 30 different articles that specify a number of freedoms, a number of rights. And uh, the first one is that all humans are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. It continues to say they are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. When we look closely at Article 1, Again, we can see this assumption that humans are born equal in dignity and rights. They don't try to tell you why, right? They just declare it. Second article says everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms that are specified in this document, in the declaration, without any sort of distinction that is based on race, color, sex, language, religion, political, or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth, or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political or international status of the country, and so on. And so it specifies that all humans are equal, that everyone, everyone has these rights equally, regardless of who they are. All human beings have a fundamental equality, and this is an assumption. This is a this is their starting point. They don't try to justify this. They don't try to tell you what their authority is for saying such a thing. Three, everyone has a right to life, a right to liberty and security of their person. Four says that no one shall ever be made the slave of anyone else. No one shall be held in slavery or servitude. And it continues to say slavery and the slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. Article 5 says no one is supposed to be subjected, no one shall be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment. There's a, articles that talk about the right to property, articles that talk about the right to a fair, equal public hearing by an impartial tribunal that uh, where you have a right to know what, who's charging you and what charges are against you. And uh, this continues for 30 articles. I'm not going to list them all. But the point here is the fundamental foundation of this document, the authority on which it is based, is not given. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights rests on a higher authority. But what exactly is that higher authority? The Declaration never tells us. It just assumes it. In 1982, the United Nations representative to the UN from Iran referred to the Un Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a secularized understanding of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And he said it is impossible for Muslims to implement this declaration without contravening and contradicting Islamic law. This representative to the United Nations from Iran was actually onto something. 
one of the key persons who crafted the United the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for the UN was a man by the name of Charles Malik, who was a devout Lebanese Christian of Arab descent and uh, Near Eastern, and he explicitly framed in his language, in working on the Declaration, the, the language uh, to, to match Judeo-Christian norms with regard to value. Many scholars have commented how belief in human rights today is a sort of secularized religion. That um, when we search for a foundation for such a belief, it comes up wanting. Human rights cannot be grounded in any concept of human nature that comes from science. In fact, the idea of human nature itself is not really even a scientific concept. If we look at contemporary evolutionary biology, for example, it by and large follows the understanding of Darwin that there is no difference, in qualitatively speaking, between humans and um, other animals. The difference is a matter of degree rather than an in-kind difference. So we may ask, well, where do we ground human rights? How does the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, how does it justify itself? What is needed to ground the concept of human rights is a high view of humanity, or what is often called a high anthropology, anthropology a, an anthropology that uh, sees humans as exalted in some way by the very fact of their being human. In the following clip, historian Tom Holland discusses how there was nothing at all historically inevitable about the development of the concept of human rights. Um, said to me, especially by, by humanist friends, they will, they will say, um, um, obviously Christianity has played a part in Western liberal values, um, but uh, even without Jesus Christ, we, we would have gotten to where we've gotten to. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I, and it's so odd that it tends to be people who, who valorise science and mm. Darwin and the theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm entirely with Stephen Jay Gould on this, who okay. says, who famously said that um, if you rewound the clock of Earth's history, you would not get humans. There's nothing inevitable about the way that, that evolution has gone. If you know, a creature in the Precambrian gets squashed, mm -hmm. then potentially the entire course of life Mm -hmm. has changed yeah. we have you know we yeah. all have eight fingers yeah you know, I mean, so and, and i think the same is true of historical contingency mm -hmm. there's nothing inevitable at all about the emergence of um the qualities or the val the values or um the teachings of of christianity at all mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you can't you I can't mean, they would, assemble they would, them they would, from they other would, sources well you know i mean if, if you want a, a, a sense of, of, um, of what the world might have looked like um, without Christianity, you could look at India, right. where you have very rich philosophical traditions, you have very mm. rich traditions of, of worshipping gods. Um, you, you don't have something that emerges and essentially wipes that out. Mm. Um, you, I, you know, absolutely imagine a world where Christianity doesn't emerge and you know, that 10% of Jews and, 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 and what, Jew, what, what, what the Jewish scriptures offer to Gentiles remains highly appealing. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of churn of, of conversion, but because the difficulty of becoming Jewish is such, mm -hmm. it would never rise, you know, it would never become universalist on the scale that Christianity does. But you could imagine that there are, you know, people continue to worship the traditional gods mm -hmm. and that there are kind of philosophical traditions that go back many, many thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's no place there for Christianity in that, that, that kind of alternative world. Mm. And could we, though, have generated some kind of universal human rights and that, that sort of stuff? Out but I don't of see why you would. Materials. Right. Why would you? I mean, right. the, the idea of human rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
the idea that human rights kind of hangs in the ether, waiting mm. to be discovered, right. is, is as theological as believing that the Lord mm. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and sits at the hand of God, God the Father. Yes. I mean, it's, 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 yes. it's, it requires a leap of faith. Yes. The difference is, is that Christians recognise that belief in, 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 in the divinity of Christ requires belief. Whereas, <laughs> you know, lots of people just assume yeah. that human rights are something that exists. Yes. But they're not. They're, they're, right. they're the, the, the result of specifically legal developments in medieval Christendom, yes. uh, the, the, the emergence of, of um, uh, this theory by the canon rights lawyer, by, by, by the canon lawyers in, from the 12th century onwards, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't just spontaneously emerge. Yes, but you hold dear to your heart those liberal values. You personally hold dear to your hearts that that the weak should not be cast off, and that there's there's an equality. Of yeah, all but I recognise now that they're not, you know, that they're mm. Christian values. Yes, yes. And of course, the what it opens up is the is the recognition that that actually without Christian faith, mm. then w ultimately, what is the underpinning for that? Yes. And the, the, the kind of idea of, uh, that, that, that humanists propagate that somehow science proves this, I mean, it seems to me grotesque. Right. You know, right. Science, science is a mirror in which you see what you want to see reflected back. Yes. So the Nazis use science to justify yeah. you know, racial genocide, yeah, racial. and liberals use it to justify, uh, you know, let's you know, hug the world. Yes, but both of them, yeah, reflect the cultural yes. prejudices of the, 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 the people who are looking in that mirror of science. Therefore, do you worry about Western civilization going forwards? If, I mean, certainly the church is exploding in places like China and in other places in South America and Africa, but here in the West, it's on the wane. Do you worry that these well, I think, I go? think, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about this. I think what's happened is, I mean. Christianity was as vibrant as it has ever been, it's deeply held um, in, in, in the years of the First World War. Mm -hmm. It did not precipitate a, a collapse in faith. If anything, it, 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 it consolidated it. Mm -hmm. And in the years that followed the Second World War, again, there was very, very high uh, religious commitment. And then it, in the 60s, it dropped off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And so the, the question is, what, you know, what happened? I think one of the things that happened was that um, we emerged from... from the, the experience of the war. And as people began to realise what had happened, particularly with the Holocaust, um, there, was, there was a kind of recalibration of our sense of, of what evil is. Mm. Um, and so we no longer needed the devil mm -hmm. because we had Hitler. Right. We no longer needed hell because we had Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And so ever since... Ever since the um, ever since the war, when most people in the West want to know what is right, what is good, mm -hmm. they look at the Nazis and they do whatever the, the opposite to what the Nazis did. Right. So it's a bit like um, it's a cross between um, you know Plato's parable of the people in the cave of mm -hmm. the shadows and and mm -hmm. Nietzsche's parable of the, the death of God, but his corpse remains in the in the um, in mm -hmm. the cave casting shadows. Mm -hmm. What, what we're seeing is the shadow of Christianity. We look at Nazism mm. and the shadow that Nazism casts tells us what, what, what Christian values and ethics are. Mm. So enshrined at the heart of every Western society in the wake of the war mm. is the utter conviction that racism is the ultimate evil mm. and that the, the, the weak should be cared for so there should be welfare states. Mm. And these have become the the um, absolute foundations of the way that governments function mm -hmm. and universities function and opinion formers function mm -hmm. and the, the worst insult that you can give anyone is to say they're a racist or a Nazi. Sure. Yeah. The risk with that, which I think we're slightly seeing now, is that what do you do when people turn around and say, yeah, okay, I'm a racist or yeah, I'm a Nazi or I, I don't want to let refugees in or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. What resources then do you have to yeah. make this case a beyond kind of screaming racist? Yes. And that I think is when you start to realize just how rooted in deeply Christian assumptions these arguments actually are yeah. and how denuded the attempt to try and make these arguments is. If you don't have this, 
mythic resonance that Christianity brings them. And I don't use mythic in it as an insult. I mean mythic in the sense that this is a kind of deep, rich... It, 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 it transcends ideology. It transcends mm. commandments. It, mm. it, it, mm. You know, it transcends... The drama that we live in and... Yeah, it's... It's, 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 a, it's... Yeah, it's drama. Mm. Mm. Strange new world of the Bible that we've got to inhabit. And, but without that, yeah, it, it's like castles in the air to start. I think, about. well, it's like castles in the air, or it's, it's, it's a very attenuated version. Mm. It's right. thin gruel. Belief in human rights requires taking a leap of faith. Indeed, it requires a very specific Judeo-Christian leap of faith. Historian Brian Tierney shows how the development of the concept of human rights in the European Christian Middle Ages was deeply contingent upon the beliefs and the concerns of that age. Tierney describes how in the 1100s, the church teachers of canon law were the first to develop the concepts and language to express what they interpreted as the biblical idea that each individual had rights conceived of as a type of inherent liberty, power, or faculty. By 1300, the jurists of the church had developed a robust concept of human rights, and they rooted the rights of freedom, equality, self-defense, substance for the poor, minority rights for non-Christians, marriage, property, legal procedure in terms of trials, and so on, not in the custom of law or the tradition of cultures, but in the inherent dignity of human beings as beings who were created in the image and likeness of God. Kings, queens, and princes could never take away such rights through any law that they might pass because such rights, based on human dignity, were inalienable. One finds this medieval Christian concept of unalienable rights clearly in the United States Declaration of Independence, which says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. At the time when Thomas Jefferson penned these foundational words, he assumed that such rights were obvious to all cultures in all times and places. However, says Tierney, this was not the actual historical case. Jefferson's self-evident truths about inalienable rights have not seemed evident to most of the human race over most of recorded history. In fact, the idea of human rights and the concepts of dignity and equality have a very unique cultural, religious, and intellectual pedigree. They come from the Christian Middle Ages. But were the Christians of the Middle Ages the innovators of these ideas? If not, where do the foundations of these concepts of human rights, dignity, and equality ultimately lie? To discover the conceptual foundations of all these concepts, we have to begin with the Bible. Bishop Desmond Tutu points out that the Bible makes some quite staggering assertions about human beings which have come to be the foundations of the culture of basic human rights that have become so commonplace in our day and age. The Genesis creation narrative asserts that all those who trace their familiar line of descent to the lineage of Adam, that is all human beings, are created, elected, and ordained as the image and likeness of God, as God's chosen representatives within the created cosmos. This grants all human beings an equal status with regard to their God-given dignity. 
In his chapter in the book Christianity and Human Rights, pictured here, Bishop Tutu explains how the Bible claims for all human beings this exalted status that we are all, each one of us, created in the divine image, that it has nothing to do with this or that extraneous attribute, which by the nature of the case can be possessed only by some people. He says where one would have expected the author of Genesis to claim that it was only Jews who were created in the image of God. Instead, the passage in Genesis which talks about the image of God asserts, asserts that it is all human beings who have be, been created in the divine image. That this attribute is a universal phenomenon was not self-evident at all in the rest of the ancient world. Even someone as smart as Aristotle taught that human personality was not universally possessed by all human beings because he thought slaves in his view were not persons the babylonian creation narrative makes human beings have a low destiny and purpose as those intended to be the slaves and scavengers of the god not so the biblical worldview which de declares that the human being created in the image of God, is meant to be God's viceroy, God's representative, and having rule over the rest of the creation on behalf of God. To have dominion, not in an authoritarian or destructive manner, but to hold sway as God would hold sway, compassionately, gently, caringly, enabling each part of creation to come fully into its own and to realize its potential for the good of the whole, contributing to the harmony and unity which was God's intention for the whole of creation. And even more wonderfully, this human person is destined to know and so to love God and to dwell with the divine forever and ever, enjoying unspeakable delights in the presence of God. The consequences that flow from these biblical assertions are quite staggering. First, human life, as all life, is a gift from the gracious and ever generous creator of all. It is therefore inviolable, and we must therefore have a deep reverence for the sanctity of human life. The life of every person is inviolable as a gift from God. And since this person is created in the image of God and is a God carrier, a second consequence would be that we should not just respect such a person, but we should have a deep reverence for that person. This preciousness, this infinite worth is intrinsic to who we all are and is inalienable as a gift from God to be acknowledged as an inalienable right of all human persons equally. In his book, Justice, Yale professor Nicholas Waltersdorf shows that the concept of inherent human rights first emerges from the moral vision of the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, and then the biblical idea of human rights was given explicit conceptualization by church canon lawyers beginning in the 1100s. Waltersdorf writes, The recognition not only of natural rights, but of natural inherent rights, goes back to the Hebrew Bible and the Christian scriptures. Even though other ancient cultures had ethical theories, they had no concept of rights or theory of rights. There is no theory of rights, says Waltersdorf, to be found in ancient Greek or Roman ethical theory. It is only when this idea of rights from the Bible gets incorporated into the thought of the early church fathers that we have the emergence of a true theory of rights. The incursion of scripture into the thought world of late antiquity made possible the rights culture that we are all familiar with today. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion of human rights, dignity, and equality.
and I hope you can join us next time as we continue our conversation.